Hi there, it's Friday the 22nd of May 2020. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to ITB. Let's get started. The UK Supreme Court has provided us with the final instalment in Fowler's case, which I've been following for a number of years. The case concerns the impact on a double tax treaty of a domestic law income characterisation rule. Let me remind you of the facts. The taxpayer is an individual and is resident in South Africa. He is a professional diver. For part of the year, he works on offshore oil platforms in the UK. He performs that work under an employment contract with a UK company, and of course, he is paid a salary. Article 14 of the South Africa-UK Treaty corresponds to Article 15 of the OECD Model Treaty. Article 14.1 says this, Subject to the provisions of Articles 15, 17 and 18 of this Convention, salaries, wages and other similar remuneration derived by a resident of a contracting state in respect of an employment shall be taxable only in that state unless the employment is exercised in the other contracting state. If the employment is so exercised, such remuneration as is derived therefrom may be taxed in that other state. Based on the facts I have described, Article 14.1 would allow the taxpayer's salary to be taxed in the UK for the simple reason that his employment with the UK company is exercised only in the UK. But note the highlighted words, salaries, wages and other similar remuneration derived in respect of an employment. None of those words is defined in the treaty, but the treaty does contain Article 3.2. As regards the application of this convention at any time by a contracting state, any term not defined therein shall, unless the context otherwise requires, have the meaning that it has at that time under the law of that state for the purposes of the taxes to which this convention applies, any meaning under the applicable tax laws of that state prevailing over a meaning given to the term under other laws of that state. In this case, it is the UK which would be applying the treaty. And so, Article 3.2 says that, in regard to the undefined terms in the treaty, the UK domestic law meanings of those terms, if such meanings exist, are required to be used, subject to the various conditions which are included in Article 3.2. Well, the taxpayer argued that those undefined terms in Article 14.1 do have UK domestic law meanings, and thus those domestic law meanings should be used in accordance with Article 3.2. The UK domestic law treats certain divers who are in fact employed in an unusual way. The relevant provision in UK domestic law is Section 15.2. The performance of the duties of employment is instead treated for income tax purposes as the carrying on of a trade in the United Kingdom. There are two points which should be noted with this provision, section 15.2. Firstly, and obviously, the diver is treated for UK income tax purposes to be carrying on a trade in the UK. And secondly, that treatment is instead of the actual employment. In other words, the diver is treated as not carrying on the duties of employment. And so the taxpayer's argument was essentially this. Section 15.2 deems the taxpayer to be carrying on a trade. Therefore, the business profits article in the South Africa Treaty, Article 7, applies to the taxpayer. 
the UK tax authorities accepted that the taxpayer did not have a PE in the UK under the definition of PE in Article 5 of the treaty. Accordingly, Article 7.1 would provide an exemption from UK income tax. And Article 14.1 does not apply because Section 15.2 of the UK domestic law says that the taxpayer is treated as not carrying on the duties of employment. That last point about Article 14.1 not applying is very important. From the taxpayer's viewpoint, it would not be sufficient to merely establish that Article 7.1 applies to provide an exemption. And that's because Article 7 always allows a specific provision, like Article 14, to have priority. In the South Africa-UK Treaty, that priority is achieved by Article 7.6, which is set out here. And so for that reason, the taxpayer had to establish that Article 14.1 does not apply. Well, the Supreme Court reversed the decision of the Court of Appeal and held in favour of the UK tax authorities. Lord Briggs said this, In short, nothing in Section 15 purports to alter the settled meaning of the relevant terms of the treaty, viewed from the perspective of UK tax law. Furthermore, Section 15 creates its fiction not for the purpose of deciding whether qualifying employed divers are to be taxed in the UK upon their employment income, but for the purpose of adjusting how that income is to be taxed, specifically by allowing a more generous regime for the deduction of expenses. If one asks, as is required, for what purposes and between whom is the fiction created, it is plainly not for the purpose of rendering a qualifying diver immune from tax in the UK, nor adjudicating between the UK and South Africa as the potential recipient of tax. It is for the purpose of adjusting the basis of a continuing UK income tax liability which arises from the receipt of employment income. Therefore, to apply the deeming provision in section 15.2 so as to alter the meaning of terms in the treaty with the result of rendering a qualifying diver immune from UK taxation would be contrary to its purpose. It would also produce an anomalous result. Nor should Article 3.2 of the treaty be construed so as to bring a qualifying diver within Article 7 rather than Article 14. To do so would be contrary to the purposes of the treaty. This is because, as is recognised by Article 2.1, the treaty is not concerned with the manner in which taxes falling within the scope of the treaty are levied. Section 15 charges income tax on the employment income of an employed diver, but in a particular manner which includes the fiction that the diver is carrying on a trade. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app In Australia, the government has introduced into Parliament a bill which, amongst other things, will amend the hybrid mismatch rules to implement changes which were announced last year. For a copy of the bill and the explanatory memorandum, please go to our website or app. Also in Australia, the tax authorities have issued updated guidance on the country's GAR. For a copy of the updated guidance, please go to our website or app. In Cambodia, the government has issued guidance on withholding tax on interest and dividends received by securities investors. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In India, the Chennai Income Tax Appellate Tribunal has decided a case 
in regard to the tax depreciation rate for digital content developed by a film animation and special effects company. The issue in the case was whether the digital content satisfies the definition of computer software. If it does, it would qualify for a significantly higher depreciation rate. The relevant definition of computer software is any computer program recorded on any disk, tape, perforated media or other information storage device. The tribunal held that the digital content does not satisfy that definition. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. Also in India, the Supreme Court has decided a case in regard to withholding tax on payments made to non-resident cricket associations in respect of cricket matches played in India. Although the non-resident cricket associations might be entitled to treaty benefits, the Supreme Court held that the domestic law withholding obligations should be complied with, regardless of the potential treaty benefits. The non-resident cricket associations should subsequently claim their treaty benefits by seeking a refund of any excess tax paid. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. And also in India, the tax authorities have notified that the existing transfer pricing safe harbour rules will be applicable for another tax year. For a copy of the notification, please go to our website or app. In Indonesia, the government has issued a detailed regulation which will introduce 10% VAT on inbound digital services, effective the 1st of July 2020. You'll remember that this initiative was included in general terms in a regulation issued last month. For a copy of the detailed regulation and a related announcement by the Indonesian tax authorities, please go to our website or app. And the Philippines might also impose VAT at the standard 12% rate on inbound digital services. The chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee has introduced a bill to do so. This will be one to watch. Also in the Philippines, the government is trying to accelerate the proposed corporate income tax rate cuts in the Satira bill, which is still before Congress. You'll remember that Satira will reduce the corporate income tax rate, which is currently 30%, by two percentage points for every two years until the rate becomes 20% in 2029. It will also impose significant limitations on corporate tax incentives. Well, in response to COVID-19, the government is proposing that the corporate income tax rate be cut to 25% with effect from the 1st of July 2020. This will be also one to watch. In Thailand, the government has approved a number of tax measures designed to attract multinationals to relocate their production operations to the country. An obvious target for such measures are multinationals which want to move existing manufacturing operations out of China. The measures involve additional income tax deductions for certain expenses. 100% for the installation of automated systems. 50% for the salaries of highly skilled workers and 150% for training costs. To qualify for these additional deductions, the expenses must be incurred between the 1st of January 2019 and the 31st of December 2020. In Denmark, the government has announced an agreement with the country's financial sector for a new dividend withholding tax procedure, with the objective of avoiding any further significant revenue losses from fraud.
Under the new procedure, non-resident shareholders of Danish companies will be required to register themselves and their Danish bank accounts with the Danish tax authorities. The aim is that the correct treaty-based withholding tax rate will be applied up front, thus avoiding the need for subsequent refunds. If it turns out that insufficient withholding tax was collected, the Danish tax authorities will be entitled to collect the shortfall from the Danish bank. For a copy of the government's announcement, please go to our website or app. Also in Denmark, the tax board has decided a case in regard to the operation of the country's thin capitalisation rules. The taxpayer company borrowed money from a third-party bank to finance a real estate development. The taxpayer's parent company provided the third-party bank with two forms of security in regard to the loan. Firstly, collateral in the form of a pledge of the parent's shares in the taxpayer. And secondly, a guarantee from the parent. Under Denmark's thin capitalisation rules, third-party debt is treated as related party debt if it is collateralised by a related party. That's exactly the situation here. However, the taxpayer put forward two interesting arguments. The first argument was that both the pledge of the parent's shares in the taxpayer and the parent's guarantee should be ignored because they did not provide any significant support to the third party bank. According to the taxpayer, the parent's only substantial asset was its shareholding in the taxpayer. That meant that the third party bank was not in a materially stronger position by virtue of the pledge and the guarantee. The board rejected this argument on the basis that the third party bank insisted on receiving the pledge and the guarantee and thus they must have been considered as important. And the second argument was a variation on the first. The bank loan should be viewed as collateralised, not in totality, but only to the extent of the value of the pledge and the guarantee, which, according to the taxpayer, was a relatively small value. The board also rejected that argument, based on a review of the legislative and judicial history of the FinCap rules. And so the bank loan was correctly treated by the tax authorities as related party debt. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. The European Court of Justice has decided a case in regard to the UK's VAT rules for commodity transactions. The court decided that the UK was not authorised by the EU Council to introduce new simplification measures in those rules. The UK was therefore in breach of the EU VAT directive. And in case you were wondering, this case reflects the fact that the ECJ retains jurisdiction over the UK during the Brexit transition period which is currently scheduled to end on the 31st of December, 2020. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In the EU, France and Germany have issued a joint statement which proposes a European recovery initiative, which includes a 500 billion euros recovery fund all of which will be financed through borrowing by the European Commission on behalf of the EU and not by tax increases. In regard to tax, the joint statement endorses effective minimum taxation and fair taxation of the digital economy within the EU, ideally based on a successful conclusion of the OECD work and establishing a common corporate tax base and a WTO compliant carbon border adjustment mechanism. For a copy of the joint statement, please go to our website or app. 
the European Commission has published its 2020 edition of country-specific recommendations covering the 27 EU member states and the UK. For a copy of the recommendations, please go to our website or app. France has entered into three agreements with each of Belgium, Germany and Switzerland in regard to the taxation of cross-border workers in response to COVID-19. For copies of the three agreements, please go to our website or app. In the Netherlands, the Supreme Court has decided an important case in regard to the debt versus equity characterization of perpetual securities. The securities were issued with these key terms. You'll notice that the securities had no fixed maturity date, but they were stated to be obligations of the issuer and they were redeemable at the option of the issuer on several dates. The court addressed two issues. The first issue was whether the securities should be characterised as equity or debt for Dutch tax purposes. The court held that the securities should be characterised as debt because the issuer has a repayment obligation, although the obligation was conditional. And the second issue was whether the securities were profit participating. The court held that they were not. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Norway, the government has presented a revised budget for 2020. Several items caught my eye. Firstly, GAR might be amended to ensure that capital gains tax cannot be avoided on the sale of assets via a corporate demerger. Secondly, there are temporary changes for 2020 and 2021 to the petroleum tax regime, including accelerated depreciation and the conversion of tax losses into cash. And thirdly, accelerated depreciation for new investments in fixed assets. In the UK, the First Tier Tribunal has decided a case in regard to the deductibility of advisory fees for an investment company. The taxpayer company paid fees to three sets of advisors in regard to a possible sale of a subsidiary, an investment bank, an accounting firm and a law firm. The tribunal considered whether the fees qualified as deductible expenses of management of the investment company. It held that the fees which were for advice as to the extent of the financial problems in the subsidiary and how best to deal with those problems qualified as expenses of management. However, it also held that fees which were for advice relating to the sale process did not qualify as expenses of management. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. Also in the UK, the Supreme Court has decided a case in regard to the imposition of property taxes called business rates in regard to automatic teller machines which are located in retail stores. In a complex decision, the court held that the ATMs should not cause an additional tax liability. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. And also in the UK, the government has released its new tariff regime called the UK General Tariff for customs duty purposes. This will replace the EU's common external tariff after the Brexit transition period, which, as you know, is currently scheduled to end on the 31st of December 2020. For a copy of the government statement, which links to the full tariff list, please go to our website or app. In Kenya, the Tax Appeals Tribunal has decided a VAT case in regard to the zero rating of exported services. 
The taxpayer is a Kenyan subsidiary within the Coca-Cola Group. The taxpayer provides marketing services to a US company within the group. That US company holds the rights to Coca-Cola trademarks for Africa. The marketing services are focused on the Kenyan market for Coca-Cola goods. The US company in turn provides the marketing services to the manufacturer of the Coca-Cola goods in Eswatini and the goods are then imported into Kenya. Under Kenya's VAT law, exported services are zero rated. An exported service is defined as a service provided for use or consumption outside Kenya. The tax authorities argued that this definition was not satisfied in this case, as the marketing services were focused on the Kenyan market. The tribunal disagreed. It looked at the contractual arrangements and held that the marketing services were provided for use or consumption by the US company outside Kenya. In reaching this decision, the tribunal relied in part on the OECD International VAT GST guidelines. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Nigeria, the tax authorities have issued guidance on the application of the VAT amendments which were made in the 2019 Finance Act, including the increase in the standard VAT rate from 5% to 7.5%. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In Bahrain, the tax authorities have issued guidance on the VAT treatment of the oil and gas industry. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In Saudi Arabia, the tax authorities have issued guidance on the transitional rules for the increase in the VAT rate from 5% to 15%, which will be effective on the 1st of July. Interestingly, the transitional rules distinguish between contracts signed or invoices issued before the 11th of May 2020, which was the announcement date for the increase to 15%, and contracts signed or invoices issued from the 11th of May 2020 to the 30th of June 2020. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. Costa Rica has been formally invited to become a member of the OECD. When it does so, it will be the 38th member. In Mexico, the tax authorities have issued a notice on the imposition of VAT withholding by non-resident digital platforms in regard to inbound digital services, commencing on the 1st of June. For a copy of the notice, please go to our website or app. In the US, the IRS has issued Announcement 2020-6 in regard to the US Double Tax Treaty impact of the replacement of NAFTA by the US MCA. As you know, the term NAFTA is commonly used in the Limitation on Benefits article in US treaties. Over the last 18 months, several commentators have pointed to the looming problem when NAFTA is replaced by the USMCA, which is not mentioned in the LOB articles. However, in announcement 2020-6, the IRS indicates that the US government will in future interpret references to NAFTA in LOB articles as including the USMCA. It also says that the US government will contact treaty partners to confirm that they agree with that interpretation. For a copy of the announcement, please go to our website or app. Also in the US, 
a further development in the Altera transfer pricing case concerning employee stock option costs. The government has filed its brief, which opposes Altera's appeal to the Supreme Court. For a copy of the brief, please go to our website or app. I have two articles for you this week. The first article is called COVID-19 and US Tax Policy. What needs to change? It's written by Reuven Aviona and it's available on the SSRN website. For a copy of this article, please go to our website or app. As usual, this author provides an interesting perspective. The US government, like other governments around the world, is currently spending trillions of dollars to contain the immediate effects of the pandemic. In the longer term, much more spending will be needed to strengthen the US social safety net, which was revealed as uniquely porous among OECD countries and has led to many unnecessary deaths. Politicians are discussing universal health insurance as well as free public college education and a massive investment in infrastructure. All of this will require a lot of money. Some more revenue can be extracted from current taxes like the individual and corporate income taxes as well as the payroll tax. But there are limits. We can have a very high corporate tax rate, but the corporate tax is only 10% of total revenues. And the individual tax and the payroll tax, the remaining 90%, cannot be raised too high because that will discourage work. Thus, in my opinion, there is no escape. The US will have to join the rest of the world and enact a federal VAT. The second article is called Germany's License Barrier Rule and its Application of the Nexus Approach for Preferential Tax Regimes. It's written by Marcus Greinert, Suzanne Carnath and Teresa Siebing and it's published in Tax Notes Today International. The authors explain that under Germany's so-called license barrier rule, a German licensee cannot deduct license payments as operating expenses if the royalties are paid to a foreign related party and the royalty revenue is taxed under a harmful preferential tax regime. The rule also covers licensing arrangements between a permanent establishment and another company in the same group. This article describes the implementation of the rule and the guidance which was recently provided by the Ministry of Finance. That guidance does not give a final view on whether or not the US FIDI regime qualifies as a preferential tax regime for the purposes of the license barrier rule. The authors make this comment. There is a strong argument for a narrow interpretation of the term preferential regime that would only include foreign regimes with a specific qualified IP reference. Thus, the license barrier would not affect the FIDI regime. Although the name refers to income from intangible assets, in practice, FIDI constitutes a general preferential system that provides tax benefits not only to royalty income, but also to other kinds of income. In fact, the calculation of the FIDI benefit is made regardless of the existence of royalty income or intangible assets. Nevertheless, it remains to be seen how the German fiscal authorities will interpret the vague legal term preferential regime in the future.
Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 22nd of May, 2020. I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend.